I just got my favorite pair of boots back. Uh, I had literally worn a hole through the bottom of them. So Seth took them to go get them resold and uh, it is like walking on a cloud. It is so great. Finally getting those back. Haven't been able to wear them for months because you know, when it was sunny, I would just wear them. Like, okay, there's a hole in the bottom, whatever. But when it rains, which in Nashville is like half the time, you obviously cannot wear boots with holes in the bottom because you will get soggy feet. Anyway, that is not what we were here to talk about today. Today, I'm going to show you the downsides of commercial real estate, or I guess generally being in real estate. Uh, because I feel like a lot of people always show the positives, how much money they're making, how many projects they're able to buy, whatever. They don't really talk to you about the tough side of real estate, the things that can go wrong, with which there are many. There are so many things that go wrong on a daily basis. Uh, I'm gonna share with you just a few of them so that you understand really what you're getting into. Obviously on this channel, we're sharing the ups and downs and, and a lot of the positives in commercial real estate too. But again, it's just, it's not fair to you to show one side. What we're really trying to do here is to educate you on commercial real estate investing so that you can go out and do these projects yourself. And you're definitely going to be encountering these issues. So you need to know all of the things that could potentially happen. And look, sometimes, there's just stuff that's gonna happen that you can't account for. One of the stories that I'm gonna share with you today is something that I never thought would happen to me, uh, but it all came down to how we handled it. It could have absolutely cost us everything, but we worked through it and that's that. That's real estate. The best real estate investors are problem solvers. That's all that matters. So first up, this was actually on the first deal that I ever did. I had two partners on it. You can actually check out this video here if you want to dive deeper into the story of that deal. But one thing that I didn't really kind of fully share in that video is that one of my partners who had signed on the debt, he was one of the, I mean, there's only three of us, right? So he is one third of the decision making at that project. He disappeared overnight. He took a lot of people's money and uh, he had basically been forging signatures on documents saying that certain people had invested when they hadn't. He had told, and this wasn't in my project, this was just in his own personal projects. He had uh, double sold shares, which meant you would buy in for 50,000 and then he would sell that exact same share to somebody else for 50,000 again. So where was that money going? So it ended up all kind of coming crashing down uh, pretty significantly. When he took the final draw from his bank for a construction project that he was working on and disappeared, never paid the contractor. So of course that whole project started freaking out. Well, he and I were supposed to close on a second property together about a week before stuff started getting weird. I would call him, I would text him, he wouldn't respond. He wouldn't respond to the title company. We needed to get updated personal financials over to everybody. We needed to get all this stuff in for the bank so that we could close on time. Well, the day of closing arrives, crickets. Absolutely nothing. Can't get him to show up. I'm thinking, okay, maybe he's out of town. Maybe he's on an island somewhere and doesn't have service and he just didn't fully think through all of this. Well, um, it turns out that I had no idea all this other stuff was going on in the background. That was when he decided to just disappear. That actually started to affect two different deals, right? Because we were supposed to close. That was day of closing, he's, he's gone. We had to move the closing. Um, I had to negotiate with the seller to let them know what was going on. We were trying to figure everything else out. Ended up being able to bring in another investor that I partnered with and we were able to close it about two weeks later and which is very rare. I had a very good partner and still, I mean, he and I are still partners in this deal to this day. And that left me, one, we got that deal figured out, but that left me with this first deal that I had ever done where he was a guarantor on the note. The one thing that really scared us was if he ended up getting investigated by the federal government, which he still may be, I don't know, then my property and this other investor that was involved in the project with him, we could get tied up into a lawsuit that would take years. It would freeze the asset because he owes a lot of other people money. He owns shares of this asset. We wouldn't be able to do anything without the federal government's permission. And I didn't want to go through any of that. So uh, I've obviously never had to deal with that. It was not a very fun time. 
but fortunately we were able to get it figured out. We got him out of the deal, not through any communication with him, but because somebody else ended up getting a settlement against him because he just never showed up to court. So yeah, that was it. I mean, we the deal ended up not doing as well because of a lot of things that went wrong with it. Um, you know, when you have one third of your partnership leave that has the relationship with the bank, things get a little, uh, uh, there's a little tension going around with everybody. We ended up still coming out uh, in the in the black uh, on that project, which I'm very excited about. Um, couldn't have gone really any better. So there you have it. I mean, that's that's one that you will never think could happen to you. The guy just disappeared overnight, and I think that he escaped with like with millions of dollars. But we'll see. I don't know. He's still in Nashville. Oh, he's still. He's, I've, I've seen him around every now and then. He's not really in real estate anymore. I don't know what he's doing. Uh, I mean, if he did make off with millions of dollars, I, I'm sure he's just enjoying early retirement. We will see. So on that same project, this was before any of that happened, we had had the building inspected before we bought it. And I figured since we'd had it inspected, everything came back fine, that there wouldn't be anything to worry about. Now, luckily, we always have a, an additional line of credit set up with the bank for tenant improvements or for any general improvements to the building. Because you never know what's gonna happen. And you know, fortunately we did that because about a month or two months into owning the property, the HVAC system, which was in kind of an old school, like served the entire building, which was 6,000 square feet, one unit, blows out. And all of a sudden we get hit with a $20,000 bill to come in and replace this HVAC system. Now, that's not the end of the world, but imagine what that would have been like had we not taken out a line of credit for $120,000 to fix up the building. One that wasn't in our budget to begin with, but we would have gotten screwed. I mean, all the partners would have had to have come out of pocket to pay for that, which is never a fun thing going back to your partners and saying, hey guys, we totally missed this, even though it was inspected and y'all saw the inspection report. Uh, I'm going to need you to fork over about $7,000 in addition to your original investment. Nobody ever wants to do that. So lesson learned there, always have a contingency, always have a backup plan. Even if everything in the building looks perfect, plan on it not being so. This next one is fun because we're kind of going through some of it right now, uh, but it has to do with property takeovers. So obviously when you buy an asset, there's kind of a takeover phase. Right, there's a lot of stuff that unless you've gone through that process before, you wouldn't really even think about. Like all the way down to calling the electrical service and getting everything moved into your name. I mean, that's kind of obvious, right? You've got to shift the utilities over, but there's a lot of little things like that you don't think about. So we are pretty adamant about not taking over properties with tenants in place unless we are buying the asset for those tenants. Right, so sometimes if you're buying a triple net lease or you're buying a shopping center or something like that, you are buying the asset for the income it produces, which comes with tenants, right? So you're buying the existing tenants. And this office building that we were sitting in now, literally the same room, uh, the previous owner had a maintenance guy that lived on site which for a 28,000 square foot office building is not normal. For any size office building is not normal, but this building's only three stories, it's tiny. So the guy's living in this office and uh, you know, that's fine. We're having to deal with a bunch of weird stuff. Like he keeps smoking in his house and it's disrupting the tenants. Uh, it's not really a very pleasant situation because every time we walked into the building, it, it just smelled like a straight up ashtray, which is so gross to me. After we did the takeover for the building, we said, hey, uh, I can't even remember the guy's name. We no longer need your services. Uh, you know, we'll give you a few weeks to move out. He'd already been prepped uh, by the previous seller that of course he would have to move out. So he was out within a week or two um, of our taking over the building and we get into the space and it's just an absolute wreck. I mean, the floors were covered in just stuff, like dirt, like they just hadn't been taken care of it for a while. They kind of left their pseudo kitchen and some food. So I, I had to get a crew in here 
to just completely scrub everything down because also it smelled like cigarettes. You think about these drop ceilings are basically like collectors for smells. So of course they just absorb all of that cigarette smoke. And uh, you know, I get a call from one of the guys that's cleaning out the space for us and uh, which is a call I never thought that I would get, ever. He's like, hey boss, uh, did you know that they were going to the bathroom in the closet? And uh, I was like, I'm sorry, I uh, don't think I've had my coffee this morning. What did you just say to me? He said, yeah, they were going to the bathroom in buckets in the closet. Which to me was just like, one, absolutely repulsive. Two, kind of funny, like what the hell is going on? Three, the bathroom is right over there. It's like two doors down. So I don't know if it was laziness or what, but uh, yeah, we had to dispose of, I guess you'd call it hazardous waste <laughs> in an office building. You never know what you're gonna find when you take over the space. Also, there are some times when um, tenants can be hostile. And so what I would say too is te technically it was not legal for him to live in, in this building anyway, uh, because you have to have a certificate of occupancy that is suitable for residential use. Now this property is, it's a high density commercial, so we can do residential use here, but the space wasn't set up for that. Like you have to have bedrooms and you have to have bathrooms and there's all sorts of things you have to meet for residential use, of which this building is not. It is an office building where I have my offices. So some of the other things that you can expect when doing a takeover are how weird things get when you're going through some place where other people are actually supposed to be living. Uh, so not office buildings, but I'm talking about apartments, hotels. Obviously we just did a takeover for a hotel for Salt Ranch. We did a little video on that if you wanna check that out here. But we had a tenant that wanted to stay on site and work security for us, which I was immediately like, absolutely not. We cannot do this. Well, uh, of course, as things tend to do, uh, things went wrong and the security, the, the, the fence company was not able to get out on site and install when they told us they could. Our security system was, I think it still hasn't been installed yet. We're still working on that. It's been a couple of weeks. So we're sitting here going, all right, we're about to take over this hotel where nobody's going to be and we don't really have security for it. So we end up negotiating with the guy. We say, look, we'll let you stay here for another week if you'll watch the place and keep doing security. Because he was running security for the owners before, which is why they were letting him live on the property. And of course we paid him in addition to that, but it was, um, def it definitely got interesting with him because you know by the end of the week, he didn't really want to leave and started saying that uh, one of my partners uh, was lying to him and not paying him enough money, which absolutely wasn't true because I was the one that was writing the checks paying him. Uh, so it just got a little weird um, and he definitely showed us uh, his gun a couple of times, uh, which, you know, whenever you're looking at real estate is always a little awkward uh, when somebody brings a gun to a real estate fight. So that was that. Uh, luckily, we got him off site with no problems, um, no issues. Uh, but you again, you just never know what you're going to get when you go into a takeover. So going into one of those, of course, get estoppels. If you have tenants with leases in place, always get an estoppel. That will tell you if the tenant and the landlord both agree on what the lease is. Because a landlord may give you a lease that the tenant doesn't actually have. So you need to double check that. But also make sure that the seller has vacated the premises prior to closing and make that a condition of closing because you just never know what you're gonna take over. This next one's a lot of fun. Uh, I still have PTSD from this one, but uh, this past year, we really started to blow up the development and investment company. Uh, in 2020, I had about $5 million in asset center management, and so far we're sitting well over $33 million, and it's only six months into 2021, eight months. Wow, that shows you how much I have been able to keep track of time. Eight months into 2021. A couple of things that you should know is that there are good and bad times of the year to raise capital. Who would have thought that? I had no idea. So. Lo and behold, we decided to put the property under contract in August with a November closing. Terrible idea because you know what happens in November? Thanksgiving. You basically lose a week. Investors don't care. They're with their families, whatever. 
So we go back and extend with the sellers for a December 31st closing. I don't know how you could make a closing timing any worse than on New Year's Eve. Uh, so that was an absolute nightmare because not only did we lose a week in November, we lost b basically two weeks in December. So we extended for 30 days, but really we only got 14 because who's going to talk to you over the holidays about giving you money? A lot of people are trying to wrap up the year. They're trying to figure out what they want to do for the following year. They're spending time with their families and they're probably out of town, which I mean, they're investors, right? They have a lot of money. They're probably going to go spend December on an island or skiing in Jackson Hole. And that is literally what we kept finding. Everybody was like, hey, I'm skiing. I'll be back next week. We'll talk then. Hey, I'm spending time with my family. Call me next week. We'll talk then. Well, it came to literally within two hours of uh, December 30, I guess really January 1st, because it's like 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock at night on December 31st, we're, we're having to negotiate with the seller. One of the biggest reasons we kept getting kicked was we had some partners involved in the deal that later decided they didn't have the bandwidth to be partners in the deal. We had gone through financing with them on the books. The lender had taken the loan to committee with them and the partnership. So we had gotten approval and everything. We were set to close at the end of December and funding gets pulled because now we have 50% of the partnership that we had had. It's a substantial enough change. They've got to go back to committee. Well, guess what? Banks don't do in December. They're pretty much just like investors. They are not working for basically a week, two weeks. So that was, uh, that was a nightmare. We had just about every funding issue that you could have on that deal. And I really do attribute it to the time of year because we ended up negotiating everything with the seller. We got an extension for another 30 days. We wrapped everything up in January. It was totally fine because guess what? Everybody's back to it. You know, my, one of my goals this year is to put a million dollars into real estate. So let's call Tyler. And uh, it was totally fine. But guys, two hours away from January 1st, 2021, and I'm sitting here on the phone just trying to figure out how we're going to get everything figured out. Not really how I wanted to spend my December, all stressed out about a capital raise. So there you go. Make sure that you've really thought through when that closing date is because you never know what's gonna happen with holidays or whatever uh, that could impact your raise in a way that you just you never thought, right? Like try to eliminate whatever exterior factors there could be. And look, the reason that it was so stressful was that uh, it, I had $200,000 on the line that I didn't have. I had borrowed money from an investor to use for the earnest money payment uh, because I didn't have the money. Right, like I just decided to take this big risk. I knew what I was gonna be able to pull off and what I wanted to do, and I was confident enough in my abilities. But that's what we had on the line, was well over 200 grand of money that I didn't have. So I didn't really have a choice, which, you know, for better or worse, I kind of like backing myself into a corner because sometimes you just have to push forward and there's no other way out. Uh, that has worked really well for me. May not work well for you, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but I do work well under pressure, and again, it's. How hard are you willing to work to make this happen? I mean, are you going to go put it in? Are you going to spend Christmas Eve? Are you gonna spend New Year's Eve? Are you gonna spend all of Thanksgiving? I know that order was a little messed up, but you get, what, you get my point. Are you gonna do that on the phone with your investors, bothering them during family time, trying to get the deal wrapped up? Because at the end of the day, that's what it takes. That's what it's like being a deal sponsor. So look, stories could go on for days and days. I just picked a few that were honestly kind of very different, uh, but to give you a good picture of what you actually face when you get into doing these deals. It's not all rainbows and butterflies, stuff will go wrong. But again, at the end of the day, how do you solve the problem? Because that's, that's where sponsors make their money. That's where investors, real estate investors make their money is how they solve the problems. There's gonna be problems. I don't need to know what the problem is. How are we gonna figure it out? I don't care what the problem is. How are we gonna figure it out? Because that's basically the one guarantee in real estate. Stuff is gonna pop up. How are you gonna handle it?